And now we come to the absolutely key phenomenon of physics. It's what exposes the rank falsehood of the entire dogma of man-made climate change. It is the principle of saturation. My guest today is Jeremy Niebuhr. Very kind of you to have me on, on your program. We've had some very distinguished speakers, I know that. Um, I got into this uh, climate change issue uh, through my contact with a chap called Christopher Booker uh, in, in the 90s, mid-90s and late 90s. <clears throat> I went to a, a debate in the church house in London uh, he, where Professor Plymer from um, Adelaide and Melbourne University was speaking, a very distinguished Australian physicist, phys geologist. And I was staggered by what he uh, tell, told us. And my eyes were opened. And after that, I got really quite far into it. I was asked by the Bruges Group, which is a sort of think tank over here, to do a pamphlet on EU, the EU and climate change, which I did. And then I, since then, I've got more and more into it. I've published three books now on, on it. Now, they're not long books, about 100 pages, 120 pages. Um, on the subject, and the last one was published earlier this year. So that's me, really. Um, uh, uh, but um, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it because I think it's a terrible deception that's been wrought upon the world by by certain individuals in, in, the, in the 1980s. Uh, I'm going to that quite fully in my last book. I have uh, all three of your books on Kindle. They are have all, uh, let's see, it's a trilogy, All is Well, All Will Be Well, CO2, Nature's Gift, and eco socialism, and that's uh, right. yeah, excellent books, very well written, and they all came out in the last three years, correct? That's, that's correct. I, I just want to make a point about being a lawyer. People often say, oh, "Of course, he's not a climate scientist. What does he know about climate?" And the answer to that is, first of all, there are no such thing as climate scientists. You'll never get a degree in climate science that I'm aware of. There are, of course, disciplines such as meteorology and um, uh, geology, which is critical. Um, but climate science as a whole, it, it doesn't uh, doesn't exist as far as I know. Uh, but lawyers are very good at analyzing evidence. And this whole racket on climate change is not based on evidence, it's based on belief. And it's based on denial of contradictor and contrary statements. Um, so having said that, I, I, I'm also refer occasionally to my notes because one has to be very precise about this subject. It's not generalist, it's not political, it's not consensus. It's very specific observational science. So at times I will look down. It's not because I'm bored with the subject, it's because I need to be sure where I'm going. I want to talk about four things, and then finally on the evidence. The first is solar radiation, which is essentially essential to the whole subject. Then there's the transfer of heat from the planet's surface to the lower atmosphere called the troposphere. Uh, which is essential, of course, <clears throat> before in order to understand the greenhouse effect. Then there's the greenhouse effect. What is that? What does it consist of exactly? And then finally, there's the doctrine or the phenomenon or the scientific uh, characteristic of saturation. And you'll know about saturation, but saturation is the killer of uh, phenomenon because it, it's, it, 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 it is a description of how CO2 is unable to absorb more radiation simply because it's already absorbed all of it that's available to it. And then finally, the empirical evidence. I, I've got three examples um, of, over the past ages, of geological ages and the last four, four ice ages and the past uh, 14,000 years since we ended our last ice age. So perhaps I could start with solar radiation. This, uh, this may be very much beginner stuff for you, and I, I think it's fair it will be, but it may not be so much for a lot of other people. I found when I give my talks, public talks, that people are astonished to hear this sort of stuff for the first time. Tom, you'd be amazed at the lack of information. Anyway, the sun's energy reaches the upper atmosphere in various forms of rays. Gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet C rays are very dangerous, but they're largely absorbed in the upper atmosphere. And then there's shortwave infrared radiation. And the main gases, uh, nitrogen, which form about, I think, 78%, and oxygen, about 21%, um, and uh, argon, 0.1%. These are, are what's known as transparent gases. They're what's called non-polar. 
The importance of that is they don't have what's called a dipole electric exchange. That is in a charged a, a charged negative polarity between negative and positive, or positive and negative atoms. And this is of immense significance because it means that the infrared ra radiation can pass straight through and is not impeded or absorbed by the um, molecules, the CO2 molecules. Uh, it is otherwise when we get to the um, a, a long wave radiation, which is radiated from the surface. And I said already, nitrogen and oxygen are very necessary to absorb the, some of the dangerous um, solar rays. And ozone, of course, in the atmosphere, as we all know, um, absorbs most UVB, that's ultraviolet B um, radiation, which is fairly dangerous. Some of it gets to the Earth's surface, but most of the ultraviolet rays on the Earth's surface are actually UVA, and it's what turns you brown if you go to the Caribbean or that sort of place, if you want to. It's very windy, I find, there. Um, and the remaining gases in the atmosphere, 0.9% of them, are trace gases. These are the greenhouse gases. Um, uh, and and they, they're critically important because they are not transparent. They're what's called opaque. Um, I'll explain that in a second. They have three or five atoms. And this allows for the dipole moment of the, the polarity of the electrical charge between two atoms um, in the molecule. Um, now, the dipole moment is, is a funny word. Uh, it's used by scientists. Scientists tend to use words that other people think most peculiar. Uh, but dipole means two poles, obviously. Uh, and a moment is a very interesting word. I, in fact, I spent a few minutes on that, so a couple of minutes. It's derived from the Latin word moere or movere. I think they, the Romans would have pronounced it like the Italians, moere. And uh, it, to move. And uh, the word motus is derived from it, which is, mo uh, uh, which is the word for, mo for movement or motion. But the Latin word is derived from an Indo-European um, um, uh, root, uh, which means to push away. Uh, the word mu, it is. So you have this very interesting uh, notion of polarity and repulsion, which are characteristic of electromagnetic uh, waves. And it's therefore a very, very good word to describe it. Uh, so you have this, uh, the difference in electronegativity between two chemically bonded atoms, that's what a moment is. Uh, before leaving um, the various gases that fill the atmosphere, can I just consider the content of the greenhouse gases, both in relation to each other and in relation to the atmosphere? In relation to each other, water vapor, as you know, Tom, perfectly well, is the dominant greenhouse gas at 95% of content. It, it is a gas, of course, being H2O, but it's not. people don't think of it as a gas. But nevertheless, it's treated as a gas, and it's highly significant, far more significant than any other greenhouse gas. CO2, or carbon dioxide, represents 3.97%, so it's very small. In terms of the atmosphere, CO2 uh, occupies 417 parts per million of the atmosphere. Uh, that, I think, is actually higher. It's about time it was updated. I, I, I would imagine it's well into 425, something around like that, because it is increasing steadily. Um, methane has a ludicrously small percentage, 1.8 parts per million. Uh, really, uh, such a lot of nonsense is talked about methane. It has scarcely any effect on temperature. Um, it's, that's for another, sub, another subject. But Professor Weingarten, Weingarten, I don't know if he's been on your program, but he's yeah. the most amazing man. Uh, he, he makes it so clear. He and Happer are the outstanding scientists on this subject. Um, so that's solar radiation. And then may I now turn to transfer of heat from the planet's surface, which is obviously the, very important to consider that. Um, it must be said that 52% of the sun's rays do not actually reach the surface. 29% are absorbed by aerosols in the upper atmosphere and lower down by clouds and ice and snow. Aerosols are of what's called particulates, they're tiny specks of, of dust, and m m most of them, most of it, volcanic ash, um, but also dust storms and the like. And the, these particulates are suspended in the upper atmosphere, and they, 
It's not known, Professor Happer makes this point again and again, it's not really known precisely how aerosols work in relation to the atmosphere. Um, there was an a article by, C, what was the name, Stephen Schneider and Razul, Professor Razul in 1971, which deals with this also. Um, but they are significant, and they reflect um, the sun's rays. 23% is absorbed directly by CO2 in the upper atmosphere and also by ozone and also by aerosols to some extent. So we're left with 48%. Now, of that 48%, evaporation and convection are, are very important. 25% of, of the uh, energy from the of that 48% rises by evaporation and is disseminated through convection to the rest of the planet. Um, uh, and and it's, a very, it's a very important pro process in the exchange of, uh, of heat. 5% rises by conduction. It's not a particularly efficient means of, of transfer because it's, it's concerned with the contact between molecules and, tra and, and trans the transmission or translation of energy by simple contact through, 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 the, through the molecular uh, collision. And the third means for the last 18% is, of course, radiation. And radiation, an absolutely fascinating subject. And uh, the, the radiation is formed by long wave, infrared, electromagnetic energy, or loosely called photons. Um, now, 12% of this escapes through to space direct, through the 8 to 13 micron atmospheric window. We'll be looking at what a micron is in a minute. Um, there's no greenhouse gas within those frequencies. Uh, there is, it, it, the the, it, the uh, spectrum of radiation has no intervening um, gas to interfere with it. Um, but 6% of this radiation, and it's a very small percentage of the, of the radiation that actually reaches the surface when you consider it, 6%, some people say 5%, is absorbed by greenhouse gases within very specific limited electromagnetic bands. Now, I'll be looking at the next part of the talk, um, which follows very shortly, at the actual process of the greenhouse effect, because it's, whilst it's complex in one sense, it, it's actually very beautifully, beautifully balanced. But what does absorption do? That's the question we need to ask. Well, what it does is that photons are absorbed in the way I'll describe and are converted into heat. And they are immediately re-emitted as photons and then immediately reabsorbed as heat. It's a, a strange process, but it, it's continuous. I have to say all this is instantaneous. There's no point talking about it as if it happens. You know, it's just a miraculous process that happens instantly, as is, of course, absorption, as is the way that rises through the troposphere. It's a constant process. And what happens is the warm particles rise by convection, convection, through the diminishing uh, pressure of the atmosphere of the troposphere. The troposphere is the first layer of atmosphere, as you know, and above it is the stratosphere. Beyond that is the mesosphere and the thermosphere. But we're concerned really with the troposphere and to a limited extent with the stratosphere. So the warm molecules rise up to, towards the, um, at, uh, the stratosphere. And as they do so, they lose heat. They lo don't lose it very rapidly initially. They lose it at the rate of about minus 6.5 degrees centigrade per kilometre. And the reason for that is that uh, water vapor is quite dense in the lower part of the atmosphere and has a lot of latent heat. Um, uh, but as the, as the water vapor gets thinner and thinner, as it reaches the upper part of the troposphere, uh, the latent heat disappears or is diminished. And so the lapse rate increases. It increases to about minus nine degrees per, per kilometer. Now, this is important because when it reaches the top of the troposphere, it's, it, it's pretty cold. It's minus 50 degrees. Um, uh, but at that point, it hits the base of the, of the stratosphere. And what does that do? It's highly significant because as the heat rises from the greenhouse effect, which is no more than 100 meters above the surface of the Earth, and rises the 8 to 15 kilometers through the troposphere, losing heat, 
it loses it because of the variable temperature caused by an interesting idea of thermodynamic, thermodynamic work and also the diminishing pressure. But when it hits the, the bottom of the stratosphere, it gets to what's called isothermic conditions. There, the temperature is constant. It is not variable. And that is a condition in which radiation operates. And radiation takes over from convection. What happens then? Well, the convection process is completed by the drift down, I put it that way, it's not like that, but the descent of cold molecules of air down to the troposphere and the, towards the surface. Now, this is truly miraculous. When you think about it, here nature has ordained that through a simple process of 6% of the sun's rays being emitted by infrared low in, into the lower atmosphere, you have a balance of temperature of around about 15 degrees centigrade, both by the rising of uh, uh, CO2 molecules uh, uh, charged with heat, um, and also by the descent of cool molecules on radiation out to space. It is quite remarkable. And were it not that, that the case, the Earth will be a snowball and uninhabitable. Let us then, I don't want to give you too much to chew on too quickly, but uh, it's really essential that we look at the greenhouse effect, if, if that's all right. Um, you, of course, know about this, Tom, and, uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it's not something that people are, well, are at all aware of. It's, the IPC has never bothered to explain it, really. First thing to understand, there is no greenhouse in the sky, as you know. There's no trap. There's no blanket. The, 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 the absurd Prime Minister of, of, the, of the United Kingdom at the, what was it called, the COP, the Conference of the Parties, a shameful assembly, really, not the people, but the purpose of it. Um, he said, uh, you know, he talked about CO2 being trapping in a blanket and keeping all the hot air in. I mean, that's all. he contributed to that to some very considerable degree. It's just rubbish. What is essentially the greenhouse effect? Well, it's the exchange of photons for heat and their re-emission and, and absorption and re-emission. Um, and it's done in compliance with three scientific phenomena or, or principles. The first is quanta of energy of photons of electromagnetic radiation. We'll have a look at that. The second thing is the essential fact of the frequency or wavelength of radiation, which governs whether radiation can or cannot be absorbed. And finally, the important interaction with, CO, with uh, water vapor, because water vapor is the, is the dominant, dominant um, factor in greenhouse gas. It's, it operates in it's so many more radiation bands than CO2 or any of the others. Um, and so, and so it's, it's very significant. Let's deal very briefly with quanta. Um, don't don't worry, because I can't understand quantum mechanics. And I, I, if I met anyone who says they do, I wouldn't believe him. Um, uh, so I, feel, I remember Feynman said something like that. But uh, what Planck did, Max Planck, this great scientist of the early 20th century, he was faced, the scientists at the time, were faced with this conundrum. that The principle that if you increase radiation, you exponentially increase heat as a consequence meant that you would get heat at right at an infinite level, which, of course, was absurd. And it was Planck who proposed and was able to ju justify the notion of quanta of energy, packets, as it were. I mean, I, I, I consider them as packets. I don't know. Um, you know, those little things you put in the dishwasher. <laughs> but anyway, packets. Um, the interaction of of of, of uh, the electromagnetic energy of the photon with the dipole moment of the CO2 mo molecule. Quanta uh, is very important for that because the quanta of energy of the photon has to be precisely what is required to oscillate the molecule, whether by vibration or rotation or both, or most effectively by both. I won't go into the detail, it's fascinating. There's a very good chat called Professor Michael Van Biesen who gives um, these 
these internet talks on atmospheric physics. He's really worth watching. He's a very able man. He describes this beautifully. And it's this oscillation that alone creates the heat. Now, then let's talk about a frequency and wavelength. Uh, first of all, frequency is the number of crests and troughs in a wave over a given distance. That distance is a thousandth of one millimeter. <laughs> it's not, not something you can put a ruler on. And wavelength, well, doing talks about the same thing, but that is the distance between crests and troughs. Now, we come now nearly to my first chart because the 667.5 cm wavelength is close to the maximum of the spectrum of radiation, and so at the level where most heat is generated. Now, you'll see there the top blue line, that is the spectrum of radiation without any greenhouse gases, just as it would be if there were none. At, at a presumed temperature of 15 degrees C, the average of the ter Earth's temperature. Now, you'll see there the big gap, the big slash there, that is the effect of CO2 absorbing radiation and slowing its radiation, slowing its progress to space. But uh, the important thing for this purpose is to see that this, you'll see that the, it's roughly in the 667.5 wavelength band, if you see that. And that is close to the maximum point of radiation at 15 degrees C. As the radiation intensifies, that curve moves that way. But at the normal Earth's temperature of 15 degrees, that is what it is. And so you'll see that CO2 is absorbing in a warm part of the, very warm part of the spectrum. Um, I'll stop that now. Um, that makes it, makes it more important than it would otherwise be. And there's another thing that makes it more important. And that is in the 15 micron band, or the, the say the 667.5 wavelength. CO, um, water vapor absorbs 65% of the radiation, but CO2 absorbs 35%. So these two factors, the fact that CO2 is absorbing at a high level of radiation and at 35% in the key wavelength band, make it far more important than its proportionate density would suggest you remember that it only occupies 3.9 for seven seven for seven three point nine seven percent of all greenhouse gases but professor Happer is of the view I, I don't think I'm misquoting him that um, co2's greenhouse effect is around about 25 percent possibly more 30 percent and that's the reason now why is this all important what what is the essence of the greenhouse effect well, it's the principal means of maintaining a habitable temperature on Earth. It's done by the, as I've mentioned before, the gradual slowing of escape of radiated heat due to the absorption re-emission process of cycles and the descent of cooled air from the tropopause to cool the lower atmosphere. And as I've said, the temperature of the Earth would be 33 degrees lower than it is were it not for this. And we should be intensely grateful daily to nature for making this happen and to be sure that that is the case. The idea that human beings can fiddle around with that fantastic balance is ludicrous. And now we come to the absolutely key physical, physical phenomenon of physics. It's what exposes the rank falsehood of the entire dogma of man-made climate change. It is the principle of saturation. It's, as I say, a misleading term because it, it implies that CO2 is saturated with radiation. But it isn't really, it's radiation which is saturated with CO2. What it means is that there's no more radiation for CO2 to absorb because it's already absorbed it. Um, adding more CO2 doesn't add more radiation. If you want more radiation, more heat, you need more radiation wavelength bands, which CO2 is capable of absorbing. And it, there aren't any. There is a little one at, uh, at right at the extremity on the on left of that spectrum, uh, but it's of no significance because it's a tiny, tiny radiation levels. It doesn't affect the surface. It has to be said, the 15 micron band, uh, the, uh, the radiation occurs uh, at the peripheries too, uh, at, at, at 14 and 16. 
um, but it's always treated as the 15th band. So let's think about how effective is CO2 in absorbing radiation. And when we thought about that, uh, which is very important, well, let's see what happens if CO2 is doubled, because scientists like to talk about that. They called it climate sensitivity. All it means is doubling CO2 and see what happens. So let's have a look first at the effectiveness of CO2 um, in relation to uh, temperature. It's a well-known uh, uh, chart, but it was prepared in 2010. And so the the it, it shows the CO2 level in the atmosphere. It's just about 385, whereas now it's 417. Um, but it's 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 a very good diagram. Um, you'll see there on the left that uh, it's di uh, it's divided into sections of 20 parts per million of each each um, section. Now at 20 parts per million on the extreme left. It is absorbed at least 50% CO2 of all available radiation. Bear in mind that radiation is only available to CO2 in the 15 micron band. And from thereafter, it declines logarithmically. And so you can see how, how you, when you get to 250 parts per million, run right about there, it's, 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 it's absorbed virtually all the available radiation. Um, and these are very interesting levels. It, it, you see there, when people play about with, say, CO2, do they realize if it falls to 150, we are all dead? Because plants can't photos photosynthesize, um, and therefore um, uh, there's no food. Animals die. And now in ice ages, it's around about 180 parts per million. The reason for that is that CO2 is always absorbed by very cold uh, water, and it's released by the warming of the water. And there is the magic pre-industrial level, uh, 270 or 275. It's not that far. Net zero would mean, uh, well, it would mean catastrophe, quite clearly. So uh, just to explain the logarithmic decline, um, it, 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 um, what I like uh, is, is the analogy of, of the um, uh, paper roll. You know these paper rolls you buy, uh, and you pull off a sheet. You, you know that, Tom, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you spill a bit of coffee on a kitchen top or a bit of wine, if you're lucky, and you mop it up with a bit of paper roll of a sheet, and then it doesn't quite do the job, so you put another one on, and then perhaps another. But by the time you put three or four on, it's done. There's no point putting another 20 sheets on. It makes no difference. And that's exactly the same with CO2. After a certain level, and that's very low, as you can see on this chart, it's, it's round about 200. It makes no damn difference, forgive my language. You can go on adding to as much as you like and make no, no material difference. Let's have a look at what, how, what happens if you double CO2, the climate sensitivity. And here we look at these, this diagram, again, of um, Happer and Weingarten, Professors Happer and Weingarten, which we've looked at already. But at this stage, we're now going to look at the effect of doubling CO2. Just take you through it slowly. The blue line at the top is the radiation at the Earth's normal temperature um, uh, uh, without greenhouse gases. The black jagged line, and it, it goes up there, and it drops down. You see that, and then up again, and then round, and again there. That's for ozone and CO2, um, but, uh, and then down to there. That is the radiation with the effect of the greenhouse gases at their current levels. Now, if you look at the green line, that shows the line of radiation if CO2 wasn't present. The critical one is the red line. The red line is, if you look at the book top right, you'll see CO2 equals 800 parts per million. That's the red line. If you double CO2, you do not double the gap. This gap here, all that happens is a tiny expansion of the gap formed by the red line difference between the black line. It's almost imperceptible. It's a tiny difference. 
between the base density of CO2, 421, and the double density, 842. Now, what does this mean in terms of temperature? Well, it means an increase of three watts per square meter. Well, that doesn't mean much to anybody, <laughs> but in what it means in terms of temperature is 0.83 up to 0.85 degrees centigrade. Now, I'll take that out of the screen. Uh, I'd rarely finish this, but I don't want to conclude with, uh, this topic without saying one thing about uh, Mr. Schneider, uh, Stephen Schneider. He was a colleague of um, James Hansen in 1970 at the Goddard Institute for Space Science. They were there together. Hansen became the director of that institute and, and, until he retired. Uh, he and Schneider became fanatic climate, climate um, change advocates. Yet in 1971, Schneider, in company with the um, Ishtag, I think it's called Razul, uh, one of the chief scientists at NASA, seconded to the Goddard Institute, published a learned article in the magazine Science, in, in which they demonstrated by, uh, that um, in relation to saturation, it was CO2 was, it has saturated radiation to such an extent you would increase it by a factor of eight times, eight times, and it would make really no serious difference. And that is extraordinary, because Schneider then later became the archpriest of, of, of global warming. But not anywhere in his book in 1989, his great Bible of the first Bible after Hansen had announced climate change in 1988 to Congress, Nowhere in that book is there any mention of the fact of saturation. It's a shocking, shocking, a shocking non-disclosure of a critical factor which he himself had identified in 1971. And Wikipedia tried to make out that somehow he recanted. There's no evidence at all that he recanted. It's not true. And it, it would be extraordinary because in 1976, he published a book called The Genesis Effect of I think that's what it was called, which was predicting an ice age. And had, had he recanted, he was, told, he was supposed to have recanted in 1974. And the book was published in 1976, just before uh, the temperature shot up again. Um, and in that, if, that, if he had recanted by then, two years earlier, wouldn't he have mentioned that? Wouldn't he have said, by the way, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it, there's no such thing as saturation. It's going, you know, uh, we're going to be all right. He, he should have said that. He never mentions it, never talks just about saturation in that book. It's shocking. Um, he, here he's advocating of an ice age is going to happen. And of course, um, you know, if, 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 if CO2... Uh, had already been saturated. It's a highly relevant fact, never mentioned. Now, the IPC has tried to get round saturation. It tries it. It's pathetic, really. It tries to make out that the minute increase in temperature that arises with doubling CO2, as I've explained, causes more water vapor to be evaporated and convected, and that in turn causes more greenhouse effect because H2O is a greenhouse gas. But it's nonsense. There are three reasons. There's never been runaway warming when CO2 increases, even to 10 times its densities, as we'll see in a moment. And it conflicts with the Chatelier principle, that where you have a dynamic equilibrium that's disturbed by changing conditions, the, the, the position of the equilibrium is restored by an adjustment of those conditions, which is why positive feedback is very rare. But finally, and this is the key point, if there had been water vapor increase, it would show in the atmosphere. It would show as humidity, but it doesn't. Since 1948, there's been records of humidity maintained. You can see them in uh, Professor Humlum's website, uh, you know, Climate for You. Uh, humidity has declined in all levels of the troposphere, mainly in the upper and the middle one, but also partially in the lower. So there's been no increase in water vapor. This idea that, of, that somehow is a triggering off of, of 
water vapor increasing. It's just rubbish. It's yet another attempt at mendacity. Uh, it should be. It should, it, it's a terrible thing to dissipate these this misstatements about the truth. And finally, I'm going to conclude with the evidence. You'll be relieved. You will hear me talk so much. Um, see, the IPC hasn't produced any any very any um, what's uh, called falsifiable observational empirical evidence, falsifiable on the basis of Karl Hopper. Its vast climate deception depends on modeling, fa fabricated modeling, and suppression of contradiction. Contradictor. Belief has sort of replaced reason, and uh, you, you, you know, dogma now takes precedence over evidence. But the evidence is available. I invite anyone who reads it, looks at this video, uh, this uh, on YouTube or wherever, to visit the website of Dr. Roy Spencer at Alabama University. Alabama University is, is one of the official custodians of satellite evidence and radio sound evidence, which has been available since 1979. It's gold-plated evidence, unimpeachable. Nobody challenges it. Uh, it, it, it put, put it, thank God, it said goodbye to model, uh, to um, uh, um, measurement by um, a window box, the little boxes of measurements, because there's, they're so manipulated, it's shameful. But satellite evidence is not, cannot be, man, be manipulated. And so anyone can get on there. And what they will find is this, that since 1980, the temperature of the planet has gone up by 0.45 degrees, not, not even 0.5 degrees. And that is as we emerge from the Little Ice Age, the coldest period since the Permian extinction, the coldest period, as you'll see in a minute. Of course, we're emerging with a slow rise in temperature. <clears throat> But you will see how modest that is when I come to the next chart. <clears throat> Briefly, just look at three charts now. The, the, this is a bit of fun, and it really, it's wonderful to see because it's 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 so clear uh, the evidence. Let's look first <clears throat> at the last five hundred seventy million years. Now, the light blue line is temperature. The dark blue line is CO two. And this is the period, 570 million years, since a multicellular life first emerged. And you can see that there's no causal correlation between high temperature and high CO2, or low temperature and low CO2, not a causal correlation. You'll see for the Ordovician Silurian disparity, there's absolutely obvious. And here we have in the Carboniferous, there's a descent of CO2 colossal due to the absorption by plants which were emerging, or had emerged in that period, um, hence Carboniferous, uh, from uh, um, uh, absorbing it, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, carbon, in effect, from the atmosphere. But the, it, after the Permian extinction, there is a rapid rise <clears throat> um, of temperature, not accompanied at all by CO2, had no relations whatever. And the temperature was very high, same, then the Cretaceous right through to the Miocene. Here you have the highest temperature in the in, in a prehistoric period, and CO2 on a re really steady descent. You'll see it there, slight, slightly up. But you know, even now, CO2 is at a level where it was in the Permian extinction. I mean, the idea that CO2 is at historic high levels is terribly false and very dangerous. We need more CO2 for horticulture, not less. For our last four ice ages and the 400,000 years, past 400,000 years, the Vostok ice data make it absolutely clear that uh, there's a, a gap of between 500 and 3,000 years between rising temperature and rising CO2 um, at the time of the end of ice ages. And when we move into the period we're in now, an interglacial period between uh, ice ages. It's a very good diagram because it, it shows precisely the way CO2 follows heat by a significant period, in a significant period. And it's invariable. It's not possible to, to contradict it. It's very clear. And then the final one is the, the, uh, the evidence of the last period since the last ice age. Now, the Greenland ice core shows very clearly 
that there have been at least 20 periods when temperature was far higher than today. In fact, the temperature now is, is as, at a historically low level, uh, save for a few exceptions, the younger dryers and a few others on the way. The main earlier periods of considerable heat have been, of course, the Holocene um, heat warm period when 8,500 years ago, the Minoan about 3,300 years ago, and then more recently, the Roman period from 200 BC to about 400 AD. It was nearly three times the present level. If you look at the uh, ice core evidence of, um, of the, of the Greenland ice core, you'll see that uh, the, the temperature levels were in, in the Roman period were far higher than today. They were very wide near the Hadrian's Wall. And then the more recent one, the medieval warming period, which ended in 1310, we know that because the Denmark Strait froze over on that in that year. Temperature was far higher than today. And there's very good uh, isotope evidence, uh, oxygen isotope evidence of that. So for the for the IPCC to say, as, as they have done, I think it's the UNEP, United Nations Environmental Programme, which published this, this fallacious and fraudulent statements in, in the summary for policymakers and circulate that to around the world. To suggest that this we are the warmest period since for 125,000 years is simple, is simply mendacious. It's just mendacious. It's totally, totally, totally untrue. And 125,000 years ago was in the middle of another interglacial. Of course, it was very warm then, but it was, we are on a, a level of temperature which is almost as low as it's ever been since the last ice age. So uh, let me conclude, if I may, with this little talk. There is no contradictory evidence uh, to displace what I have just shown you. None. No distinguished professor in, uh, uh, with experience in atmospheric physics in, at a leading institution of science would risk his career in supporting the hypothesis, the fantastic hypothesis of the IPCC. It is the greatest deception, I think, that's ever been wrought on humanity. Excellent stuff. I uh, really, really enjoyed that. Um, do you want to drop any names here that you are in regular contact with Will Happer? Oh, regular. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yes. Oh, yes, regular. I mean, we're in email contact, regular. Um, less so with uh, William Wygon. He's a, he's a much more restrained. Of, he's very Dutch in a way, you know. You know and he goes there and he goes there and he goes there. Will is about the most modest man you'll ever meet, as you know. He's humble to the point of utter self-effacement, but he's he's just immaculate. His papers, he, 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 William Weingarten and, and Happer produced these fantastic papers about the relative potency of greenhouse gases. And it's very hard to find them, but you can. Cornell University, their printing shop, produced them. And it, they're immaculate. Unbelievable. I think somebody else. I think someone else described Happer's casual brilliance. I think that's a good way to describe beautiful, it. Beautiful, beautiful. He's such a lovely man. He's so generous. You know, he's so generous. He he reads my stuff, and he's just such a lovely man. I'd love to meet him. I hope I do. But I must congratulate you because your your website is highly thought of. Oh, th thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, any more books in the hopper? There, do you plan to write some more books? Well, it depends. I might turn the trilogy into one book. Um, it depends what happens. But I think the 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 um, the ball is rolling, starting to roll, uh, simply because politicians realise that um, the cost of this is is going to hurt the poor, and it is. I mean, you talk John Kerry and people like that; they know nothing about it. Uh, but when people find that they can't afford to go to work because there's a emissions zone in their area. And that's what's happening in the UK. There was a, 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 an election uh, by the current, in, of, of, the current government had to face an election in Uxbridge when the past prime minister left. And they, and they surprised everybody because they were expected to lose badly. But they, they won't because the electorate couldn't cope with, with the cost of getting to work through these um, uh, uh, emission zone limits. 
because you, what you do if you drive through the emission zone limit uh, yeah, and you haven't got the right sort of car, 60 quid. And now it's gone up to 100 quid. And these are people who, who are not earning that sort of money, anything like. So they lost the election. Bloody good thing, too. And as soon as politicians pay attention to their electorate, the better. Uh, but it is something appallingly wet and weak. The politicians are not willing to look at the truth of the of, of the dogma, but look at the effect of its compliance upon their votes. You know, it's just something very mucky and dishonourable about that. There we are. You can quote that if you want. But I, 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 I cannot tell you how important what you're doing is. Getting a voice is the main thing. It's not enough to be right. It isn't. You've got to persuade, and somehow the timing has to be right. I do think with an election, general election coming up here, um, it may be possible to ensure that a massive departure of votes from the ruling party at the moment, the Conservative Party, based on the cost of net zero and the folly of the whole damn thing, um, that that would not actually get a, a party and which would be do anything about it, but it, but the but if we could get enough votes being leaked from the ruling party currently, then somebody's going to have to sit up and listen. That's the, that's what the, my strategy is, in conjunction with those who are working with me. Fantastic. All right. On that note, we'll go ahead and wrap up. But thank you very much. This is high quality stuff, and thanks for all your work. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.